So glad that you've tuned in to this Sunday morning service. So many people are asking me, Pastor, when are we going to resume services live at our campuses? This is the answer, May 31st. That's next Sunday. Next Sunday is actually Pentecost Sunday. It was the birth of the church. What a perfect time to resume services. Starting over again in the house of God. I'm really excited. I'm going to give you some instruction because it's going to be a little different than usual. That means that we're not going to be full to capacity. We're going to be opening up in phases. How do we do that? You're going to register online. Every service, before you show up, you're going to need to register every single person in your family. So we're going to open up 300 people per service. 300 people at 9 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, and at 1 o'clock. All you do is register. Once we have your information, you'll be registered. Just come in. We're going to send you an email to show that you're registered. You show that when you come in and you're ready to go. We're going to be live, live worship. We're going to have a word from God. I am excited to see you. Also, another question that's coming up, are we going to be open up with our children? Well, our children are, is going to be in the, in the second phase. This phase, we're going to do family services. You come in with your children. Now, if they're little children and you know that they're not going to pay attention in the service, this is what we recommend. Continue with your watch party at home until we resume services for our children. If you know you have child, children that are mature, they can take notes, they're going to be involved and engaged in the service, of course, bring them into the house of God. We'd love to have them here. So this is where we're at. Next Sunday, May 31st, we're opening up. I cannot wait to see you. Also, fill out the survey. The reason we want that survey filled out because we want to make sure that we're ready to meet you where you're at and meet your needs. We absolutely love you. So this next Sunday, register online. And I'm going to do, what we're going to do this week is give you a lot more information. We're going to fine tune this. So I'm giving you some general information right now, but we're going to get more information uh, about Sunday service online. I'm going to be giving some, doing some videos and you'll be getting some push not notifications as well. Are you ready to dive into this service today. I got a word for you, and this is the word today that God has for us. I am a world changer. This is what we're doing. We are changing the world one soul at a time. Let's start off with a foundational verse in Acts 17, 6, and it says this, when, but when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city authorities and shouted, these men who have turned the whole world upside down, have come here too. What a reputation that Paul and Silas and even Jason and these brothers had. They were looking for Paul and Silas because they were preaching, doing miracles, and, and now they had a reputation of being, turning the world upside down or being world changers. This is our heritage. And God has called us to make a difference in this world. There's so many people today that are hurting that are broken, and they need God to turn their world upside down. Someone today is suicidal, they're depressed, they're brokenhearted. If God doesn't intervene, they will die in that condition. But I thank God that God has put us on this earth, and we are here not only for God to change our world, but for us to turn this world upside down. And there's not a greater need today than people needing an encounter with God, especially in these times where we're facing economic problems and people are losing their jobs. They're, they're fearful of getting sick. Many are getting sick. We serve a God that answers all of those problems. There was a day that Christ came in my life and turned my world upside down down. He gave me a meaning to live. He gave me a purpose. And today as a church, we are changing our city. We are changing our community. And we're going to continue with this assignment to turn the world upside down. We're going to dive into a story today. And it's in Mark chapter six. And Jesus right now in this story is ready to send his disciples, those that he trained to go out there and be world changers. They've been trained by the master world changer, Jesus Christ himself. And now he's saying, now you go out and change the world. I've showed you how to do it. Go do it. Let's look at Mark chapter six. And it says this. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village 
teaching the people. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, that means no luggage, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any, and, but if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet. And as, as you leave, to show that you have abandoned those people, you show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. So today what we're going to do, this, this is going to be a very simple message. And we're going to talk about five attributes of a world changer. Say it with me. I am a world changer. Five attributes of a world changer. Attribute number one is world changers have a vision to change the world. We will never be a world changer without having a vision to change the world. In Matthew 6, 6, the Bible says that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. What was he talking about? What was he referring to? He was referring to the last city that he went to, which, which was his hometown, his hometown of Nazareth. He went into that city and he was just amazed that they wouldn't believe the power to turn their world upside down, the power to change their family, the power to change their lives, their emotions was there, but they refused to believe. But Jesus did not let that stop him from being a world changer. He kept on going. And the scripture says, after he was amazed at their unbelief, then Jesus went from what? Village to village, from town to town, from coast to coast. He knew what his vision was. Jesus was sent on a vision and a mission to bring salvation to the whole world. He was here to show God's love, lay down his life, and bring salvation to people that were hurting and lost. Look at this scripture. You've heard this scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God loved the world. It was a world vision, a world mission. That whoever, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the vision and the mission was to bring eternal life, was to bring new life, new beginnings, forgiveness, freedom. Jesus knew his mission to, to show people the love of God and to give a message, to lay down his life and bring a message that would bring eternal life. It was a worldwide mission. Jesus did not let negative people or circumstances change the vision. Even though he was rejected in the last place and by Nazareth, by his, his own hometown, and, and he was amazed at their unbelief, it did not change his vision. He went after that um, city to city or village to village. We need to be careful that we don't let negative situations and negative circumstances change our vision. It's time to shake the past off and get back on track to reach those people that God has called us to reach. We are on track. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says this, we must focus on Jesus. Why focus on Jesus? He was a world changer, and this is what he did. He stayed on the vision to change the world. We must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. He saw the joy ahead of him. So he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Now he holds the honored position, the one next to God, the Father are on the heavenly throne. Think about Jesus who endured opposition. Think about Jesus who endured opposition from sinners so that you don't become tired and give up. When we're talking about being a world changer, 
We need to stay focused on the vision. Don't you get tired. Don't you get worn out, even if you're experiencing some opposition. World changers are able to handle opposition and still go forward. We are a church, and right now, even though we're not meeting in this building, you know what we're doing? We're reaching more people than we ever have reached in this season. I remember when we first started, even before we started this church, God gave me a dream, a vision that we would, and, and how this church started was a dream that God gave me. He said, go, they're sheep, and you're their shepherd. I actually heard the, the voice of God in a dream that God gave me. And I woke up in the morning and I told my wife, honey, I believe God's telling us to start a church. And she said, where and how? I, go, I don't know how to do that. And I don't know where. And I've never started a church. I don't know how to do that. But what I started doing a little bit, I started talking to some leaders. And, and I thought they were all going to encourage me and say, Pat, Marco, go ahead and do it. But a few leaders is what they did. They met with me and they began to tell me, these words, I wouldn't do it. I, I, I tried it. It didn't work. But God told me to go out there and change the world and start a church. This is what I had to do. I had to ignore all the opposition, all the negative words, and I had to go forward with the vision that God has given us. Don't get stuck with someone that's opposing you or maybe you had a bad experience and now you're just talking about your bad experience and you've forgotten your purpose. And when we forget our purpose, you know what happens? We lose our joy, we lose our peace. And, this, and, and, and the worst thing is no one's life, life is gonna be transformed. We are world changers. Let's stay focused on the vision to change the world. So attribute number one was world changers have a vision to change the world. Attribute number two, world changers have a world changing, have a world changing message. So how did Jesus change a village or a town or a community or even a person? This is how he would do it by teaching the word, by proclaiming the good news. In Mark chapter six, verse six, it says he was amazed at their unbelief. But let's focus on this. Jesus, then Jesus went from village to village and this is what he was doing teaching the people. We change people's lives by changing their thinking. And we change their thinking with our message. I remember one day we, we decided to do some outreach and this is what we did. We picked the, the toughest and most dangerous complex in San Bernardino. At that time it was named the Yellows. This, this apartment complex was infested with gang members, it was infested with drug dealing and also infested with prostitution. So what we did was we knocked on doors and we made a big, huge barbecue and we invited all the neighbors, all the drug dealers, the prostitutes, the drug addicts and people from the neighborhood. They all came. We had a barbecue, but we also had a stage. And we had our worship team sing a few songs and just preparing the atmosphere for the message that was ready to be spoken. See, we have a message that changes lives. Attribute number two, we have a message that changes lives. We began to just preach the word of God. And it looked like no one was pay, paying attention, but they were. They were drinking 40 ounces and they were smoking weed. And, and some people were even mocking while we were preaching. But then after... After it was all said and done, I made a call for those that heard the message to believe and place their faith in Jesus and be saved. To my surprise, I think I was even surprised, those people that were out there in the balconies that looked like they weren't paying attention, one by one, they started coming down in front of the stage. And I had a team that was ready to pray with them. And we started praying with them. And one of the leaders of the gang, I, I, I was right behind him and we started laying hands on him and praying with him after he heard this world changing message. And this is what he said. He goes, what are you guys doing to me? He started crying. He goes, what is this? You know what he was experiencing? The power of God. Because we cannot preach this message of salvation, of love, of forgiveness, and faith in Jesus Christ without the power of God showing up and touching lives. 
That day, many of those people in accomplice got saved. Drug dealers were saved. Prostitutes were taken off the streets. People were, were fed. And it all started with a message. We can change the world. And all we need is the Bible. All we need is boldness to actually go ahead and share what we're learning. Jesus knew this, so everywhere he went, he was teaching. See, Jesus brought the power of change through teaching them the word of God. And after the teaching of the word of God, this is what happens. Miracles happen. After the teaching of the word of God, miracles happen. We should expect miracles to happen. In Mark 16, 20, the, it says this, and the disciples went everywhere and preached. So what did the disciples do? They did exactly what Jesus taught them to do. They went everywhere and preached. See, the enemy knows this. As long as we're preaching the good news, preaching and teaching the word of God, this is what he knows. He's going to lose souls. People are going to be saved. People are going to be set free. They're going to experience the power of God. Miracles are going to happen. So what is, what is the opposition? This is the opposition. The enemy just wants us to be so busy or be fearful not to open up our mouths. Right now, our families need to be saved. Our neighbors need an encounter with God. Our city, and let's, let's talk about this. Our nation needs an encounter with God. And we're hearing a whole bunch of words out there about coronavirus and how many people are getting sick and how many people are dying. But now it is time for the church to rise up with this good news message that's more powerful than COVID-19, is more powerful than the mistakes we've made, is more powerful than the depression you might be feeling today, is more powerful than the anxiety. That's right. This message can turn your world upside down. But look at this. So the disciples went everywhere and what they do and preach. And the Lord worked through them. As we're preaching even this message right now, you know what's happening? The Lord is working through this message. The Lord is now working through me. I've learned this. My job is just to share. My job is just to open up my mouth and repeat the words of God. And it's God's job to change lives and do miracles. God promised me this. Mark, if you'll just show up, I'll do the miracles. But look at this. And the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said, confirming what they said with many, with, by many miraculous signs. The pattern is always the same in scripture. Someone's preaching the word or teaching the word, sharing about Jesus. And then what happens after that? Miracles, signs and wonders follow. What, that, what does that mean? Lives are changed. Cities are changed. Families are changed. People are healed. People are set free. People come now into a relationship with God, the biggest miracle of all. Today, every single one, one of us listening, we need a touch from God. And it started right now with some preaching. But let's look at this. The pattern always the same, the same. Teach the word, then miracles. Attribute number three of a world changer. World changers build people. They know that the only way to change the world is to change a person. That in turn brings change to a family, then his neighborhood, this city, and eventually the world. World changers build and develop world changers. World changers build and develop world changers. We will never be a world changer if we don't focus on this, building people. This is what we do. We build people. We encourage people. We, we, this is what, uh, the word for it. We make disciples of Jesus Christ. In Mark 6, 7, this is what Jesus did. Let's look at the story. And he called his 12 disciples. Now it said he called his 12 disciples. It didn't say he called disciples. This is what he did. He called tw his 12 disciples. That means if we're going to be people builders, or people developers, or disciple makers, it's gonna be something that we do intentionally. Can I ask you a question? Who are you discipling? It's a really good question because world changers always have someone underneath their wing. And that means if right now you don't have someone that you're passing on your, the knowledge and passing on your spiritual life to, today's the day 
to become a world changer. Be intentional about it. Jesus was intentional about the process of people development, and we call this disciple making. Jesus built people through the process of discipleship. World changers are, this is what they are, disciple makers. Every believer should have a disciple and be disciple. As a disciple, we learn from being disciple and then pass on what we've learned or, we've been, or what we've been taught to our disciples. And you might be saying, is there a process? Is there a process to people development? If you could develop people, this is, this is what's going to happen. There's not an organization that you can't change and turn upside down. There's not a family or neighborhood that you can't turn upside down. There's not a city that you can't reach. If we learn to do this, be people developers, or I would say this, disciple makers. And the disciple is simple. This is what it means. It just means a student. It means a learner. And this is what our goal is, is to, is to teach people to be like Jesus, to know Jesus and be like Jesus. So what is the process? So this way, Jesus called his disciples, together and began sending them out two by two, giving them, the, giving them the authority to cast out evil spirits. So Jesus, I'm going to tell you the process in a minute, but Jesus calls his 12 disciples and this is what he does. He sends them out. After training them, he sends them out. He trains them and then he sends them out. And then he gives them the same exact authority that he used to cast out demons and do miracles. He goes, I give you the same exact message. I give you the same exact authority. I give you the same exact power. I give you the same exact vision and the same exact mission. I'll give it to you. And now you could get the same exact results. I cast out demons. You can cast out demons. I preach. You can preach and you'll get the same results. So what is the process of disciple making and people development? This is it. One number one, get disciple. That, you know what that means is find someone to mentor you. Because before we can disciple others, we have to be in a position to be taught. Even right now, as you're tuning in in your living room, week after week, Wednesday, Sundays and Wednesdays, you know what's happening? You're being discipled. You're being taught. But discipleship doesn't end with us being taught or being mentored. The second step of the process is recruit disciples. We need to be intentional. It might start with our own children in our house. It might start with a neighbor or a friend or a coworker. But, but, but we must be intentional. Who are you discipling for Jesus Christ? That means recruit disciples. Jesus recruited 12 disciples. He called his disciples and then he trained them and then he sent them out. Number three step of the process is teach and train disciples on a schedule. That means we'll never be a great people developer if we don't do this. Put training and teaching others on our schedule. I've been doing this now for 40 years. Every single, I'll give you the example, every single Tuesday for right around 40 years, I've had people in my living room or I meet with people for 40 years. It's on the schedule. And what do I do? I, I pass on what I've learned. I study I prepare and I train them. But it doesn't end there. Put training on a schedule weekly. And that's what the power of 12 is all about, is that you would say, I'm going to do what Jesus did. I'm going to recruit 12 and I'm going to train 12. And I'm going to train them to go, go out and recruit 12 themselves. And you know what we're going to be doing is we're all going to be growing. But teaching and training it doesn't end there. This is the next step. Empower disciples to do what they've been taught. That means you finally say, okay, I don't just train you so you can know the Bible. I train you to know and to do. So Jesus trained them in the word. They knew it. They knew the message. He, he, he trained them through his example. He trained them through his teaching, but he also did this. He was training them to go do something. What he was saying, I'm going to train you to be just like me. This is how we start changing the world or we become world changers. The power of multiplication is in disciple making. As we become uh, people developers, you know what? This will, we'll have the power to make massive, massive change in any community. See, the greatest things I'll ever do are not the things I do. The greatest accomplishments I'll ever have are the accomplishments I get done through others. Jesus knew they had a limited time on this earth. 
and he had an assignment to change the whole world. But he knew this. He could only be, while he was here on earth, one place at a time. But if he could train 12 and train them to train others, he could now season the whole earth with this message. And today, 2,020 years later, we are here as disciples of Jesus Christ because Jesus knew how to be a world changer. He did it through, cha through training his disciples to be world changers. And now we're continuing the process. Empower people, sending them out. The power of multiplication is, is in disciple making. I'm gonna give you an example. Right now, let's just say you did this. Let's say you did exactly what Jesus did and you recruited 12. And I'm talking about 12 for your whole life. You, you just did exactly what Jesus did. You, in, you find 12 people that you're gonna invest in. As you learn, whatever you learn from the word, you're gonna pass it on to them. And what if you train them to get 12? Now, 12 plus 12 times 12 equals 144. So now we're talking about at least 144. But what if those 144 train another 12. You know, we, we, we would be at 1,728 people would be, dis be disciple. But what if the 1,728 got 12? We would now reach 20,736. Do you know why we're not seeing massive multiplication like this? We've forgotten how to be world changers. We're coming back. And it just starts with one person that you love, that you care for, and you pass on what you've learned to them. And this is what they do. They pass it on to somebody else. And now we have the power of multiplication. Working for us. And you know what's going to happen? We can change a community. We can change a city. We can change a nation. I'm going to give you another example. Right now we have watch parties. And I think we have maybe a thousand to, we're, we're trying to keep track of the 2,000 watch parties right now. That means there's at least 2,000 homes, right around 2,000 homes that are tuning in right now. But let's make it simple. Let's say it's just a thousand. There's just a thousand homes right now. There's a thousand homes being tu that are tuning in right now to hear this message. And in those homes, um, there's family members in those homes. So there's usually around four to 12 people in those homes. But what if we just did this? We're talking about disciple making. What if you have a watch party and we said this, in two months, you need, to, you need to launch out just one watch party. Train one person that's in your home to have another watch party. That means that they open up their living room and now they invite their friends and family to come over and watch, 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 watch the way we're allowed to reach and be taught online. What if that happens? Well, now we'd have 2,000. But well, let's say every two months, we just go ahead and just send one more out there. That'd be 4,000 by the, by, the, by the six months. And by the eighth month, we'd have right around 8,000 watch parties, which would represent, if just four people were in each home, that would represent 46,000 to right around 96,000 people that we would be discipling on a weekly basis. Just having one, part, one watch party and every two months launching out one more. Say, Pastor, why are you going over these numbers? Because Jesus was concerned about those numbers. He had 12 disciples and he was concerned about training them to go out there and reach others. Right now, we're going to come out of COVID-19 and we're going to come out with our family, our friends, our relatives being saved. Why? Because we're world changers. And world changers build people and they, they are disciple makers. Let's look at attribute number four. World changers totally rely on God. If you're going to do this, do the, if, you're gonna do, if we're going to carry out God's mission to change the world, it's an assignment that's bigger than us. We're going to need to rely on God's help. Now, Jesus sends the disciples out. And let's take a look at this in Mark 6, 7. It says, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not take a, take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. Now, Think about this. Jesus telling them to go out there and change the world. But before he tells them to change the world, he gives them instructions. This is what I want you to do. This is what he's saying. I want you 
to totally rely on me, totally rely on my power. I'm going to give you the power and authority to cast out demons. What that means is nothing that's going to come against you. You won't have the power. I'm giving this to you to overcome and cast it out and remove it. Depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, depend on God's provision. So he tells them this. He tells them, don't take any food. That means you don't have to pack a lunch. You don't have to get You don't have to go grocery shopping. Just go right now with nothing. And he, said, he tells them, don't take any luggage with you. That means it's an all expense paid trip. I'm going to cover it all. Just think about this. You're on a vacation and someone tells you, look, I've covered it all. I took care of the airfare. I took care of all the food. You don't even need to bring luggage with you. I have it all covered. I've thought about it thoroughly. And this is what God is saying. When I send you out on an assignment, there's no excuses. You don't have to get enough food to go. You don't have to get enough money to go. You don't have to save money to go. This is what he's saying is just go out there and every single thing that you need, I have already thought of and I've already provided for. He said, don't take no luggage. Don't take any money. Because this is what he's saying. Because I will meet all your needs according to my riches. He says, don't take a change of clothes with you. And then Matthew 6.30 says, therefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is here and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? What he's saying is, don't worry about, don't worry about food. I'll make sure that you have food. I've never seen the righteous begging, begging for bread. He says, don't worry about luggage. I know every one of your needs. If you'll just seek first my kingdom, and my righteousness and my assignment. I'll give you every single thing you need. Don't take any money because I'm rich. I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Don't take any clothes with you. I got that handle too. Just think about it. You know, today what I was going to do, what I was going to do was wear clothes. And I, and I didn't have time to really look through the closet. But I was just going to wear clothes that were just given to me. Because God provides every single need. All we need to do is say, okay, God, I'm willing to go out there and be a world changer. And you know what's so great about this? Anyone can be a world changer. Where God leads, he provides. Rely on God and his power. Rely on God through his pr provision. Also rely on God to touch people's lives. He's the only one that can save a person. So the scripture says that as we're out there, some people believed and then others refused to believe and even listen. It's not our job to save a soul. You know what our job is? Is to open our mouth and share our story. Tell people about Jesus. Teach the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit's job to change someone. Give them eternal life. Give them saving faith. Set them free. God is a miracle worker. What we do is we do our part and we let God do his part. In John 3, 6, it says this. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. It's God's job to save a soul. And attribute number five, really simple, says world changers have developed a habit of taking immediate action. We need to get this. It's not just knowing what to do, but we need to take action on what we've learned. Immediate action. I've learned this that the longer we take to take action, the more likely we're not going to do it at all. World changers hear what God says and immediately take action. These disciples got instruction. Go out there. I send you out two by two. Gave them, don't take nothing with you. I give you a power and authority to cast out demons. Go tell people about me. And you know what they did in Mark, Mark 6, 12? So the disciples, what they do? They went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and to turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Timing is everything. I remember when God told me to be a full-time pastor. We started the church. Around a year into it, the, the, the church started to grow. But I, I was in the car business and I, I, loved, I loved the car business and I was doing pretty good. I was making right around $250,000 15 years ago, a year. 
That's what I was making. And, and, and it looked like the sky was the limit. I just got transferred to the number one GMC store in the whole country. And that month we had the biggest, we had a record breaking month. And I remember that, that Monday after we had a record breaking month, I was in my office and I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, it's time to be a full-time pastor. The church needs a full-time pastor. It was so easy for me to talk myself out of it and say, well, um, maybe later, not now, things are good. So I call my wife up and I go, Lisa, God's telling me that today is my last day and, and I need to be a full-time pastor. You know what my wife told me? She goes, Marco, if God's telling you, then do it. And you know what I said? But what about the bills? We just finished building our, our dream house. It was in Yucaipa. It was a beautiful house. Just finished putting a pool in it. It was really immaculate. I loved the house. It was a 4,700 square foot house right on the base of the mountain. At, at, at when I, while I was in the car business, I could drive any car that was on the lot. So every day I had to bring home a different car. Man, I just thought I was on top of the world. But God said, no, today, I want you to listen to me. I'm sending you out to another level. And you're going to have to be willing to leave your last level. I can't take you to the next place if you're holding on to the last place. So I ended up making that decision. I think God had to twist my arm a little bit, but I did. And that day I called the owner and, and, and the managers together and I told them what I was going to do. They began to laugh at me and say, Marco, you're crazy. How are you going to, how are you going to take care of your family? How, I mean, you got five girls. They, they, you have a house payment of $4,500 a month. And you know, if you leave, there's no retirement. There's no, there's no parachute. You get nothing. You're going to go from ink for making $250,000 a year to nothing. And then he asked, does, you, does the church have any money? And, and, and I go, no, the church has zero money. A matter of fact, that last, it was like a week before that, I had to pay the staff. We had no money. We, we were overdrunk. We had nothing in the account. And they were just were talking, well, how are you going to do it? And this is what I've learned. If I just act and do what God tells me to do when he tells me to do it, this is what's going to happen. God will provide. The miracles will happen. World changers don't just talk about it. They take action. In James 2.14, it says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? What good is having a vision, have faith, and not take action? Can that kind of faith save anyone? No, that kind of faith doesn't save anyone. So the disciples, though they were given power and promised provision, if they don't step out and actually go out and start preaching, laying their hands on sick people, praying for them, this is what... This is what wouldn't happen. Nobody's life would be changed. Today, we're not, we would not be here as the way we're all outreach. If I didn't do what God asked me to do, I will say this. I'm not nobody special, but I've learned this. If I just listen to God and immediately take action, God will take care of everything else. He will do the miracles. Well, that day I left, and this is what God told me, that job. And you know what God told me to do next? He told me this, sell the house. And it was my dream house, and... And I go, okay. So this is what I did. He goes, sell the house and move into San Bernardino. That's where you're ministering. And I want you to live with the people that you're ministering to. So that, that day I called my real estate agent up. I couldn't afford the house anyways. And I called her up and I said, I'm putting up the house for sale. And she goes, what price are you going to put it up for? And I just got a number out of what I wanted. And it was, a, she said it was a ridiculous number. She goes, no house in the whole area is sold for that. I go, I understand, but that's the number I want. So we put the house up for sale. And within 30 days, that house sold for double the price as my neighbor's house that had his house for sale at the same exact time. A year later after that, the economy fell apart and that house was worth 50% of its value. If I didn't make that decision, when God told me to make that decision, the provision was there, but all I needed to do was do what God told me to do when he told me to do it. And lo and behold, 15 years or 14 years later, we're reaching thousands of people every single week. Right now, we give over a million pounds of food at our downtown campus. And right now, we're refurbishing 
a warehouse. So we're going to put more food in right now. We have two campuses, three buildings, a men's home, a women's home, a women's and children's home. Lives are being changed. We are practicing being world changers. And it's the same, the same exact instructions he gave the disciples. He's given us. Now, let's get down to the final part of this story. These disciples went out and this is what they did. They preached a very simple message. And I want you to hear the message that they preach. It only had two points. I've given you five points today. I've given you five attributes of a world changer, but they only had a two point message. And this was a message. Point number one, turn from your sins. Point number two, turn to God. It was very simple. Turn from your sins and turn to God. If we're ever going to have a new life, there has to be a time that we're done living the way we're living and get sick and tired. Like those saying, we got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We need to get tired of the dysfunction, of the anger, of the addiction, of the lies and saying, I am tired of medicating myself. I'm empty. I'm hurt. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. I need change. This is what we do. There's two turns to be saved. One, turn number one. We've got to be willing to turn away from the life that we're living. Turn away from the unbelief. Turn away from doing it your way. And then you can turn to God. Turn from to turn to. And we turn to God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This same Jesus that sent the disciples out to be world changers has sent me now to you to change your world with a very simple message. If you'll just believe today, you can be saved. There's a scripture in John 14, 12. It says, I tell the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. God wants to do something great in your life. And all you have to do is believe in him. You know what God is saying? I created you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You have a purpose. And your purpose is to do great things. Even the same things I did, I want you to do. And I want you to even do greater things. I have a plan for your life. But where does it start? Placing our faith in Jesus Christ. We're a prayer away. It's a choice. The Bible says that the disciples went town to town and, and village to village as well, just like Jesus did. And some people refused to believe. And you know what happened to those that refused to believe? They were abandoned to their own fate. You know what that means? Is one day we're going to stand before God and the choices we make, we're going to have to live with. Like the old saying, you made your bed and then you're going to have to lie in it. And I pray that you would be part of another group and say, no, I'm not part of that group that's refusing to, refusing to believe. I want to be part of that group that listens and says, okay, God, change my life. Turn my world upside down. Turn my marriage upside down. Turn my emotions upside down. Depression, joy, suicidal thoughts to hope and vision. Just turn it right upside down. A, a rocky marriage turn into heal marriage. And not only a heal marriage, but a marriage that heals marriages. That's a world changer. Maybe today you're addicted. God wants to turn your world upside down. Freedom. Today's your day. You're a prayer away. Place your faith in Jesus. Jesus died for you, resurrected from the dead for you so you can have a new life. Let him turn your world upside down. Let's pray together right now in your living room, in your break room, in your car, wherever you're at. This prayer has a power to change your life. Get ready for a miracle. Bow your head, close your eyes right there in your living room. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you love me and you came to give your life for me. I realize that I'm a sinner, I've lived life my way. I'm empty, I feel lost, and I know I'm not right with you. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me. I believe that you paid the price for all the wrong I've done. I no longer need to live in guilt and shame. I can be forgiven. Forgive me, Jesus, forgive me, Lord. And I open my heart and I receive a new life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit, that same power you gave you disciples to overcome even demons. I'm asking, Lord, come into my life. Give me the power to overcome every obstacle and enemy I'm facing. 
Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I am saved. I'm born again. And I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and turning my world upside down. And use me to be a world changer. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, I want to say this. Congratulations. One of Jesus' disciples has spoken to you today. And you know what you are? You're a disciple as well. That means you're a student of Jesus Christ. And the things that Jesus did, you can do also. And it's very simple. You're a world changer. And what are world changers? Those that believe that they're world changers. They have a vision to change the world. Who are world changers? World changers have a world changing message. Who are world changers? World cha changers build people. Who are world changers? World changers totally rely on God. And world changers have developed a habit of taking immediate action. Go out there and change the world. 